Hello, everyone. My name is Nikki. I'm the education coordinator here at the BCACC. And I, we're so excited to have you join us tonight. I would like to welcome you to tonight's Matters of the Mind, Understanding Eating Disorders. We have Alex Charlton from the Looking Glass Foundation. So Alex is a registered clinical counselor um, and has been working at the Looking Glass Foundation since 2017. And um, the Looking Glass Foundation essentially brings programs and services to help people throughout the province who are um, tackling um, issues to do with eating disorders. And we are so thrilled to have you here tonight, Alex, um, because this is such an important topic and we've had so many people really wanting to just gain uh, little bits of information to help um, people in their lives, help themselves. We've got counselors, we've got people of the public. I will quickly just give you a few little bits and pieces about the BCACC and about these offerings. So the BCACC uh, is the British Columbia Association for Clinical Counselors. So anyone who's a member of our association has this designation here, that little logo you see at the bottom. Um, and it basically means they meet the highest standards for counseling in the province of BC, which is huge at this moment because counseling is about to become regulated, which is a whole other topic not to be covered tonight. Um, this is a Matters of the Mind presentation, which we have started in the last half year to bring important topics forward to anyone throughout the province, uh, whatever people might be grappling with, we're looking to bring forward the knowledge of counselors to help people in the province. And so we're always looking for suggestions. If there's topics you're looking for, definitely get in touch with me. Uh, I'll make sure my email's somewhere in the chat at some point. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the lands that I'm coming from. Uh, so I'm joining you from the lands of the Lekwungen speaking people, known today as the, uh, the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. And I encourage you, if you want, use the chat in general, but you can also place in the chat where you're coming from as well. And uh, in terms of how we will run this evening, we're gonna use the Q&A functionality you can put a question in the chat. It might get missed if things are being put there. So Q&A, and we will really try to address those at the end. Um, so that's it. We're recording this session. I know I had a lot of emails of people asking me, so I'm just going to let you all know this is going to be recorded. Typically, we have it on our website within a week. And so if you're on our newsletter, you'll get an email when um, it's done. And so with that, I want to um, basically just welcome Alex and you can just take over the show. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to having this dialogue tonight. And I just want to take a moment to share with you my positionality um, as I'm coming to this conversation as a white settler with Maori descent. Um, I am also a cis female, able bodied, and have had a lived experience um, with an eating disorder and came out through the other side. Okay, I am living on the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people's lands. Um, and as much as I would love, love, love to cover all of the nuances um, when it comes to eating disorders, I'm only going to be able to capture a small little blip. Um, and so I hope that this blip that I'm able to share will be useful um, for those of you who are supporting people who have eating disorders. Um, Hopefully this will be a confirmation or, or an affirmation of the, the work that you're doing. Um, and for those who uh, do not have experience supporting folks from this community, hopefully there's um, some useful tools and strategies and insights that you can take with you. Okay, um, this conversation can be, um, I'm going to say the word triggering for some folks. If you yourself have had a lived experience with an eating disorder or, or who have loved ones, who have struggled, um, this can bring up a lot of different feelings. Um, and so I trust that um, if something feels activating for you that you can take care of yourself, um, you can do that um, by muting me for a little bit or stepping away or grounding or orienting um, in a way that suits you. 
Okay. Um, I'm coming um, to this conversation with so many people um, in the community that have a lot of skill and expertise and wisdom, and I by no means am positioning myself as the expert, um, but coming as, as a colleague and fellow community member who has some experience and a lot of passion for this work. Okay. Um, and before we get started, if you are open to it, um, I would love to invite you to take a moment to think of a person um, in your life who struggles with an eating disorder, um, a client, a patient, um, a loved one. Um, and if you could just send them sort of in your mind's eye, a little bit of compassion, right? However you wish to do that, um, to just take a moment to honor um, that you're here for partly for them um, and sending that. And if you're open to receiving, I would love to share with you my, um, my gratitude and appreciation for all of you being here um, as you are in service to those that you're supporting. All right, so let's dive in here. I'm gonna share with you my screen. All right. So today we are going to cover types of eating disorders, common traits, behaviors, thoughts, feelings, myths and myth misconceptions and stereotypes, preconditions, contributing factors and maintaining factors, and basics of supporting um, and helpful curiosity. Okay, um, so disordered eating means any unbalanced or unhealthy set of behaviors, attitudes, and emotions surrounding eating, weight, and food. I would also argue exercise as well. And an eating disorder is a clinically si significant condition characterized by severe behaviors, attitudes, and negative emotions surrounding eating, weight, and food. And the difference is it lies in the frequency and the severity of the behaviors and the distress that, that is caused for that individual. I'm going to talk about the three um, that we often hear a lot about, which is anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. That's not to exclude the other ones. All of them are important. Um, I just don't have all of the time to cover them. Okay. The other specified feeding and eating disorders, OSFED. Um, this is where, um, you know, someone um, meets criteria for this, but doesn't meet any of the other criteria for the other eating disorders, but there still is significant distress and impairment in their functioning. The DSM um, is how our medical community assesses and diagnoses these disorders, but many people in our community have never had a formal diagnosis, but this does not change or minimize their struggle. At the Looking Glass Foundation, we do not um, require anyone to have a diagnosis, and there's a lot of I'm going to say a lot of problems when it comes to um, diagnosing um, that lots of people from more marginalized communities are often underdiagnosed or completely um, dismissed. And so the, uh, the numbers here do not reflect, I would say, an accurate estimate of how many people who are struggling. Um, and it's estimated to be about 2.7 million people in Canada, but the stats are confirmed at 1 million. Um, and globally, um, eating disorder prevalence has actually doubled from 2000, the 2000 to 2018 from 3.4 to 7.7%. Eating disorders tend to thrive in isolation and secrecy. And so I kind of think of like a triangle. We have um, isolation and secrecy, uh, we have shame, and we have eating disorders. And what we know about shame is it often causes people to withdraw or retreat um, as a way to protect. Um, if you're noticing um, any of that coming up with your clients or the people in your life, that's an indicator that the eating disorder might be a little bit more active. Um, they are often accompanied by feelings of shame, as I mentioned, and people will go to great lengths to conceal their behavior. One thing that needs to be stressed is that each case is different. I could have two clients with the exact same quote-unquote diagnosis, and the 
um, background story and the pieces of motivation that are going to help them get to recovery um, and um, the, the struggles that they're experiencing can all be slightly different. So we do not want to take a one size fits all approach. We want to have a highly individualized approach. Okay. Um, we often have a belief that certain eating disorders look a certain way, and I hope that today we can kind of dispel a little bit of that, um, because you cannot tell based off of looking at somebody if they have an eating disorder or what the eating disorder is that they're living with. An eating disorder affects one's biology, behavior, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And once someone is symptom free, so behaviorally free, and maybe if they're on the more anorexia side or restriction side, if they um, have weight restoration, this does not mean that they are fully recovered. Okay. With anorexia, um, this is a persistent restriction of energy intake leading to significantly low body weight. Um, and in, in um, context of what is minimally expected for the age, sex, developmental trajectory, and physical health. Um, and there's either an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat or persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain. Um, and they will be sort of below that average weight. Um, disturbance in the way one's body weight or shape is experienced is is often there, um, an undue influence of body shape and weight on self-evaluation or persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of current low body weight. I have lots of clients who um, also struggle with body dysmorphia. And so you'll often see that with folks who have eating disorders as they uh, one day they might be like, okay, I, I really want to recover. This isn't okay. Um, I know that it's not healthy for me on all these different levels. And then the next day they are thinking that they actually uh, need to align with the eating disorder to continue their pursuit of weight loss. Um, it's also important for me to mention here that a lot of people um, I, I'm seeing these days actually struggle with atypical anorexia, um, and these are folks who are engaging in all the same symptomology um, as anorexia nervosa, but they are not underweight. Um, and these people um, often will hold the belief or the cognitive um, structures that they failed their eating disorder, or they're not doing a good enough job at their eating disorder, or um, there's something wrong with them that they can't also um, lose more and more weight. Now there's complex reasons as to why that also is. It has to do with um, one's genetics and the body actually going into survival mode and trying to save them, right? If they hold on to the energy that they do have, it's an attempt, um, the brain and body are communicating, we need to keep this person alive. Um, so that's one thing to mention. With bulimia, um, this is recurrent episodes of binge eating. Um, an episode of binge eating is characterized by a large consumption of, of food um, in a discrete period of time, about two hour period. Um, however, people who also experience um, bulimia, they might be doing this th throughout the day and it could be more of a grazing presentation, but this is the way the DSM has, has categorized it. Um, and there's a sense of a lack of control over eating during the episode, um, feeling that one cannot stop eating um, or control how much one is eating. And there are compository behaviors um, that are an attempt to um, kind of maintain control um, or to uh, prevent weight gain. And um, the self-induced vomiting or laxatives, diuretics, um, or other medications or fasting or excessive exercise are the, the forms of, of um, I'm going to say the, the purging. And I would say that I mostly see people who struggle with the vomiting and the excess exercise. Those would be the two most common that I've seen, um, but they, they can totally use other, other forms as well. The binge eating and um, compensatory behaviors both occur on average um, once a week for three months in order to get this diagnosis. Um, Self-evaluation is unduly influenced by body shape and weight, and the disturbance does not occur exclusively during periods of anorexia or restriction. 
it's not uncommon for people to vacillate between different eating disorders. You might see somebody who starts off with having anorexia and then it changes to bulimia and then it could change to binge eating or in any of the different um, varieties. There's also, um, it's, it's not in the DSM, but it's called orthorexia. Um, this is a, um, a, a, a disordered eating that is um, has an obsession of health and wellness, um, using health as this prestige um, where there is a right way to eat and there is a wrong way to eat. And there is a moralization of how to eat um, and it can be highly controlling. Um, I've seen people who have moved into that category as an attempt to recover because they think that they're treating their bodies really well, really quote unquote pure. Um, and this is just another angle to uh, the disordered eating, right? It's, it's, a, it's a different set of rules, but it's still rigid rules when it comes to food and body. Binge eating disorder um, is the reoccurring episodes of binge eating. Uh, an episode of binge eating is characterized by both um, eating in that discrete period of time, uh, the large amount of food, um, and um, I would say that people, when they are doing this, they could have food rituals, they could be doing it in their car, they could be doing it in their room. It's often in secrecy and privacy. Um, people are often feeling a lot of shame, um, feeling like they don't have quote-unquote willpower, um, and and often um, can sit in more of that hypoarousal state or or a, a, um, have co comorbidities with depression as well. There is a sense of lack of control over eating, um, and it can you know there can be a feeling uh, that one cannot stop eating or control how much one is eating. Um, there is no compensation following a binge, unlike bulimia. Okay. Um, the binge eating episodes are associated with three or more of the following, um, eating much more rapidly than normal, eating until feeling really uncomfortably full. So we have a, um, a hunger and fullness scale, um, you, know, um, you know, one being really, 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 really hungry, five being I'm kind of good, like I don't feel hungry or full, I'm, I'm, I'm good. And then um, 10 being I'm so full, it hurts and it, it's causing a lot of discomfort, a lot of pain. Um, people would be probably in the eight, nine, 10 area of, of their fullness scale um, when it comes to binge eating. It's also important for me to mention that some people um, with disordered eating or, or eating disorders have a skewed perception of what a binge is. I've had clients say, I had a binge, I had an apple and peanut butter and a tablespoon of peanut butter and I felt so out of control. It's important that we don't um, minimize the feelings that they're having because it feels to them that they might feel out of control, especially if they're on the restrictive side of things but we don't want to be uh, confirming or affirming that, yeah, that was a binge because then we would be adding into the, um, the deception of disordered eating, right? Um, this would be at least two large portions um, and um, for one, one uh, case of, of eating. Eating alone because of feeling embarrassed, this actually, um, can be a bit of a barrier when people do come for support. Uh, when they say, I'm struggling with an eating disorder, I'm struggling with binge eating. If nobody's seen it, and if the person lives in, in what's called like a normal or straight sized body, they might be dismissed like, oh no, you're fine. Um, you don't have an issue. Um, and it really discourages people from getting the support that they need. People might feel disgusted with themselves. Um, uh, mark distress regarding the, the binge eating. Um, and on average, they would be engaging at least once a week for three months for that diagnosis. Okay. Um, at the Looking Glass Foundation, we do not have any sort of hierarchy when it comes to different eating disorders being better or worse um, or more important or less important. Our society um, is so, somewhat structured in that way where they see anorexia as being the worst and, and that's what people think of when they think of eating disorders. Um, and yes, anorexia 
um, is is connected to actually an and bulimia being tied to the high um, rates of 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 death in, when it comes to mental health. Um, but we don't want to minimize or or discredit the the experience of the other uh, variations of disordered eating and eating disorders because it is more than just a physical illness. Um, it 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 wreaks havoc on every single nook and cranny of someone's experience. Okay. Um, what we typically see across the whole board is high anxiety. Um, so I say that you know people can have anxiety and not have an eating disorder. If you have an eating disorder, you're going to also have some level of anxiety because the eating disorder is part of the coping with anxiety. Okay. Um, there's an inability to see themselves accurately, quick to dismiss strengths, inaccurate view of strengths and weaknesses, lots of isolation. I cannot stress that enough. Um, people pleasing, argumentativeness, competitiveness, manipulation even. And this is a means of protecting the eating disorder part. It is not done out of malice. So when we see with families um, and if a, if a child is... Um, lying about eating food or um, sneaking food um, or um, leaving a party early to go and um, and um, and experience um, a binge and purge um, and doing different things to to conceal that or or manipulate um, people to uh, keep the eating disorder that shows up. Um, people may not see their eating disorder as a problem. Right? At the looking glass, we only see people who think it's a problem because they want help. They want to get out of this, um, what can feel like a, a, a prison um, in, in someone's own body. Um, people out in the world, they, they, there's lots of people who um, have an eating disorder or disordered eating, but they do not recognize it as a problem. People will likely bounce back and forth between wanting to get well and wanting to stay the same. This, um, this kind of on the fence um, place is so normal. And for all of you who maybe are parents or caregivers or um, counselors or doctors, um, I have so much compassion for you if you're supporting someone in this because it can feel really exhausting to sit with someone through that chronic vacillation. Um, but it is uh, highly likely that people will, that will be a part of their journey. People could take on a helpless stance or claim that they have no control or are powerless, have high levels of shame. Um, people might minimize or exaggerate the extent of their struggle, um, struggle to share or can overshare and often have quite limited self-care. Mm -hmm. Myths, misconceptions, and stereotypes, first and foremost, it is not a choice. Um, eating disorders start, start as a way to solve a problem, right? To help people cope with trauma, um, feelings of inadequacy, um, trying to create a sense of safety within, within themselves, um, trying to um, manage existential worries, like so many different things, and I could go on. Um, and then it becomes a problem, right? At some point, this coping strategy, this resource turns into a problem. And then at that point, sometimes um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to, to get out of that, um, in part because of the, um, uh, the, 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 the mind and body um, sort of creating an attachment um, to that because it did serve a purpose. People think that it's young white women with privilege who have an eating disorder. Um, when eating disorders affect all genders, all ages, all size bodies, all ethnicities, and all socioeconomic statuses. Um, people might think that it's just a body image issue or that folks with normal or above average size bodies can't have an eating disorder. That is not true. Anorexia is, again, the only serious one I mentioned. That's not true. Um, that it's vanity or attention seeking, um, also um, not necessarily true. Someone might think it's gross or shameful that it's caused by the media. Um, now, with this one here, um, there was a research 
there was some research done um, actually in Hawaii around um, when TV and media came um, that then rates of eating disorders had increased um, exponentially. And I would say that media contributes to the comparison and the, um, the way that people um, uh, put themselves in a hierarchy of worthiness and good enoughness. And it definitely can poke and exacerbate uh, the feelings that then lead to using eating disorder coping strategies, um, but it does not cause an eating disorder. People might think there's one way to recover. That's also not true. Um, that it's an issue of willpower, that it should be easy to recover. I've heard uh, many a times, even from my own parents, uh, when I was struggling, like, just just eat or just don't eat. Just do, like, this is a simple thing. Um, and that can be really minimizing to somebody's struggle. And um, I had mentioned before that people think you can tell if someone has an eating disorder based off of their body, and that is not true. Okay. Um, it's also important to note that folks with marginalized identities are further at risk of developing eating disorders. Okay. Now, within our societal and cultural context, people are reduced to their body and judged within a body hierarchy of goodness and badness, with white, able, maleness, heteroness at the top, and people experience you know, how people experience their body is impacted by how power is conferred, what's deemed valuable in our society, the safe or unsafe experiences that someone's had, and who gets to access space. And eating disorders do not discriminate, and they can leave devastating folks, uh, de devastating effects on, on, on folks with more marginalized intersecting identities. And because the dominant narrative has been that um, that again, the eating disorders affect um, this um, identity of white, young, heterosexual, upper middle class, um, cis females, folks with diverse identities might wonder if they can even recover from something that they aren't even sure if they can have due to little to no representation of eating disorder um, support and lack of cultural competent care or lack of social family support and misdiagnosis. I have a few pieces of statistics here, but this is just a small snippet. So men make up 15% of, of cases with anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating, and up to 22% of men uh, turn to dangerous means to bulk up uh, with muscle with disordered eating behaviors. Among males who have eating disorders, 42 identify as gay, 42%. And about 16% of transgender individuals suffer from an eating disorder. Um, also with transgender folks, um, they're about four times more likely to develop an eating disorder. Um, and I would say that our, our current system um, does not reflect um, the, the, uh, the support, does not reflect the needs. Um, so we need to do some shifting and some um, increased in, in support to make it more inclusive. Um, Non-binary people may restrict their eating to appear thin and consistent with common stereotype of androgyny or androgynous people in popular culture. And um, uh, BIPOC folks with eating disorders are half as likely to be diagnosed to receive treatment. And Hispanic people are significantly more likely to suffer from bulimia than their non-Hispanic peers. Mm -hmm. So we have biological, psychological, and sociocultural issues that contribute to, to an eating disorder. Um, there is no one etiology of an eating disorder, um, and there's, there's no research to show that if you have this, 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 you're for sure going to have an eating disorder. It's highly complex, um, but we do have some pieces that, that um, can... Uh, um, identify if, if somebody could be more at risk or the things that are most likely part of their experience. So if someone has a history of dieting or have, has a close relative that's had an eating disorder, um, history of mental illness or psychiatric disorders in the family, and folks with type 1 diabetes, um, one in four women with type 1 um, diabetes develop an eating disorder. Okay. 
if people have low self-esteem, those feelings of inadequacy or lack of control in their life, depression, anxiety, perfectionism, and rigid ways of thinking, all or nothing, um, a history of trauma, uh, little t trauma, so a bunch of little t, um, or a big t trauma, um, history of abuse, sexual, physical, emotional, um, and neglect, or have body image dissatisfaction and disembodiment. These would be some psychological um, components for that. Okay. Um, is anyone not familiar with little t and big t trauma? I want to be mindful of the language I'm using. Okay. All right. So with social, there's a history of being teased or ridiculed based on size or weight, um, weightism, internalized fat phobia, um, the discrimination against larger bodies and putting thinness on a pedestal, striving for culturally relevant beauty ideals, and intergenerational and historical trauma. Um, I've worked with some clients who um, have some family lineage um, with the Holocaust and, and other um, uh, uh, World War II experiences. And there is this um, uh, epigenetic you know, transmission of scarcity around food. Um, which um, has been really fascinating to work with and, and piecing together how someone can not just heal for themselves, but also heal their lineage, right? They say that we have, we're connected to seven generations above and se seven generations um, after us as well. Any major change in a family structure or a loved one, so separation, divorce, death, this can also be a part of what can spur on an eating disorder. I would say that COVID um, did not help at all when it comes to eating disorders. We saw rates increase. We saw the need for care increase um, significantly. And my personal explanation, I'm, um, might not be the only explanation, but one of them is um, people's worlds were turned upside down and they had um, no control over or over some of the things that were going on in their personal world and definitely not um, the greater world at large. And so that big shift um, also brought up a lot of stuff for people and people uh, turned to eating disorders. Now, what's this really about? Okay, so eating disorders present about food and body, but they are just a focal point. Eating disorders are much deeper and complex than that. Right? They are about social conformity, um, binary, gender, beauty ideals, how people cope with trauma and stress, comfort, control, a tool to dissociate from the body, establish a sense of safety, lovability, or worthiness, create or change one's sense of identity, attempts to increase one's power, social power, and mitigate oppression, wrestling with existential fears of death and aging, provide a sense of purpose or escaping uh, to escape facing fears of responsibility. What can contribute to people staying stuck in their eating disorder is a sense of hopelessness or helplessness, lack of social support and role models, lack of resources, um, staying in a pre-contemplation stage, so not quite in, in the place of, okay, I'm ready, I want to make change. Right? They kind of uh, are not quite there yet. Um, wrapping most of or all of their identity to the eating disorder. Um, I've spoken with many of people who have said to me, I don't know who I'd be if I didn't have my eating disorder. I don't know, like, that, that seems really scary to, to actually not have it, because what if there's nothing left? What if I have nothing to offer the world? People often um, who have a strong aversion um, to feeling their feelings or a lack of knowledge or implementation of regulation tools um, tend to um, stay in their eating disorder longer as well. Um, so those are just some of the pieces. Um, one thing I want to mention here about the, the diversity um, and around the social power um, is, and, and I'll give an example, um, I'll give two examples um, just so, so that it, 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 it might click a bit better. 
um, is um, someone who um, has internalized racism, lives in a black body. Um, uh, I have heard a, a story of somebody who um, wanted to keep the eating disorder and it was anorexia um, because um, this person did not want to embrace um, their, their curves that they associated with, um, with being black and also felt that uh, paler skin was more desirable. And so when they were not as well, uh, their, their skin um, tone faded, right? This is so, um, like it breaks my absolute heart um, to hear this, but it's also real. And we need to be aware of how people's intersecting identities impact their desire to keep their disordered eating or eating disorder, okay? From the oppression they experience. Diet culture, I hope that many of you are familiar with diet culture. Um, and if you're not, I'm gonna give you a quick little short breakdown. And that is that diet culture is a multi-billion billion dollar industry selling conditional self-worth, leading people to believe that they will be happier if they manipulate their body and it stays that way. This produces the false belief that we are better if there is less of us. Okay. It is a system of beliefs that equates thinness to health and moral virtue, promotes weight loss as a means of attaining higher status, and demonizes certain ways of eating while elevating others. Right, Christy Harrison. If we look at the past decades, there's always a different fad diet that's coming out and saying, no sugar diet is best, or paleo is best, or veganism is best, or no, no fats or whatever. Like it's always changing. And um, this has led to a, um, let's say a widespread belief in the psyche of, of many um, that we should fear food. And that we need to protect ourselves from quote unquote bad foods. Um, and this is, I believe, contributed to um, the rigid ways that people engage with food. Okay. I'm not going to get into it today because this is that would take a very, very long conversation, but it is incredibly important um, if you can take away from this conversation to look into the the systemic roots of, of fat phobia, which is the fear of fatness. This is linked with American slave trade, European migration in the 19th century, racism and classism. And Dr. Sabrina Strings is the author of Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. And she provides the history of fat phobia. And I highly recommend it if, if, if you can. It's, it's a lengthy book, but it's um, really important when we are supporting people who have an eating disorder or disordered eating um, to, to know what this is about. Diet culture treats bodies with a settler colonial ideology, which is um, that the body is an object to be used, to be conquered and stolen. It tells us how to be and defines gender with narrow binary scripts of attractiveness and hence our worthiness, right? We, we live in, um, I'm gonna say, a, quite a toxic culture that um, a lot of, uh, you know, someone could have a million different strengths and still feel like they are not worthy to um, be happy or deserving of love or, or uh, achievements. Um, or even to really embrace who they are if they are not happy with their bodies. Okay. All right, so this triangle um, comes from ISTDP. Um, this is an intensive psychodynamic short-term um, therapy. And um, at the bottom here, we have emotions. This is only one way to conceptualize it. So if you, you're, if you have a different way of conceptualizing, please, no, no, um, no pressure to take this on. Um, but we have emotions down at the bottom. And in a family system, we learn which emotions are okay to feel and which emotions are not okay to feel. Uh, we learn which ones are pro-attachment, um, which ones could be connected to shame or embarrassment. Um, we, we learn um, you know, through different gender scripts of 
you know, which ones um, are encouraged and um, which ones could potentially um, uh, um, lose our sense of belonging. And so loneliness, joy, even joy, right? If, if someone um, has a history of trauma where they never felt joy and then later in life they did, that could feel really scary for their nervous system. They not, might not be able to hold the fullness of joy and they might want to push it away, not consciously, of course, um, or, or subconsciously. And so if any of these tie to shame um, or, or um, it feels overwhelming for the system to feel, we move to anxiety. Anxiety um, is sort of an anticipated threat. The body's registering these emotions um, as something to um, push down or get away from. So we get anxious. And um, this could show up somatically or cognitively um, through you know, increased heart rate, um, tension, um, heat. I can even feel heat in my cheeks right now um, because I'm a little bit nervous. So uh, it definitely show up uh, somatically or cognitively with rumination, um, negative thoughts of the past or the future, and people are not in the present. Now, we only have so much um, you know, cortisol and adrenaline to pump through us when we are anxious and our body naturally wants to get back to safety. And so to get back to a sense of safety, we might use defenses. Now, defenses are not bad. We need defenses. But sometimes if we are using them all the time, typically unconsciously, and we're always pushing away anxiety and emotions, it, we're just going to go round and around in, in a loop cycle. Okay, so defenses, anything that's tied to avoidance, distraction, distancing, control, or numbing. This is not specific to eating disorders, but I see it a lot with eating disorders. So this could be gambling. It could be um, different addictions. It could be um, workaholicness, right? It's, it's overworking, perfectionism, people pleasing. This could even be anger, right? If anger feels like a, a protective emotion uh, that's covering hurt and anxiety, we might we might use um, anger as a defense. Over intellectualizing um, is another defense. But when it comes to eating disorders, right, it could be avoidance of the body, avoidance of food, um, avoidance of the uncomfortable feelings, distracting with food or distracting with eating disorder behaviors, uh, distancing, control of food, control of body. Um, or numbing, and numbing can can really happen with any of the eating disorders, right? If somebody is um, binging, they could they could binge to the point of just passing out. Um, the binge and purge can also create a, a a sense of a numb. And if someone is has been restricting um, for a length of time, they can also experience that. Okay. And so with our clients, with the people in our lives, what can be helpful um, is to support them with this triangle, right? To help them identify the defenses. When are, when are they using it? What's prompting that? Um, they don't have to give the defenses up, but can they increase their awareness that, it, it's, that it's there? And then go over to the anxiety if that feels accessible to ground, to regulate with the body um, and then from that regulation point to get curious about their emotions um, and and to um, work towards moving through them and not stifling them because if there's more stifling what we know is we need to feel it to heal it i think that's a common phrase um, and this this uh, triangle really reflects that we need to come back down to the emotions to then move through and uh, eventually that will help with disordered eating. Okay. Any questions about this triangle? I want to make sure it's making sense for folks. There's questions that are unrelated. If you have a question, you can feel free, I think, put it, throw it in the chat, or you can even um, put your hand up if you wanted to ask yourself. Otherwise, we can just move on. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So part of offering support can be helping people figure out 
you know, with that triangle, what they're feeling and what the body might be trying to say through that given emotion. There is always a need connected to an emotion. And we want to help the person explore how they can go about getting that need um, met in supportive ways. Right? They could get it met with themselves, but I also believe that we are highly connected social beings and we need one another. Right? I think our hyper individual Western world is like, we need to do it on our own. But trauma research is really showing us that we, we heal in relationship. So helping people get their needs met. Um, in relationship is also great. And by relationships, I mean many different relationships. The goal is to tune in rather than to fix, cure, relieve, take away, or make better the person's feelings. Often individuals will wish they didn't have those feelings or deny the associated needs. And the neat thing is that if that uh, we're wired to return back to our baseline when our needs for safety, comfort, boundaries, and reassurance are met. When our needs are met, we, um, when our needs aren't met, we stay on guard and defend, and we keep going back through that cycle on the triangle. Okay. Eating disorders um, present about food, um, but the, that's just the focal point um, when really it's about someone's relationship with themselves and, and compromised mental health, and also an issue with society, right? That society plays a big role in this as well. When we want to support those who struggle with eating disorder behaviors, we want to support the other aspects of their overall mental health, right? I hear from a lot of clinicians who um, don't work with eating disorders um, say, oh, I'm kind of like nervous. I don't think that I'm well equipped um, to support this person. If if your client is on a wait list to work with a program or, uh, or, or another clinician for, for the eating disorder, um, I highly encourage you to work with their overall mental health um, instead of um, completely um, saying no, because what we, what we see is the, long, the, the longer people are on wait lists and getting no support actually leads to um, uh, participation dropout and then they don't make the changes that they that they want to see. So any support, I can almost say, is better than no support. And, and I say that with a bit of an asterisk that as long as people are not causing harm, <laughs> okay? Um, and we wanna help them understand what might be causing their suffering. Um, so we wanna do a lot of exploratory work and eat, eating disorders interact um, and impact many areas of someone's life. And so what I like to do is, is do almost like a bubble diagram and we list out all the different areas of their life that they think are being impacted by an eating disorder. And then we, we make the connections how and why so they can start to understand the, the significance and the importance to make some changes. Okay. Due to the high rates of relapse and length time it can take to recover. Um, now, I'm not 100% sure if this research is up to date, but I think it's about six to seven years that it can take for somebody to recover. Um, now, that's just the average. So some people can recover way, or, way sooner and some um, take a longer time. Um, but we want to know that, um, that it can take a while right, um, to, to do this work. Um, but... Uh, longer therapy doesn't necessarily mean um, better results. So there's some mixed things um, in the field. And so that's also why we need to have individualized care to understand the needs of the person that we're supporting and, and, and what level of care they might need um, at the time. Okay, research indicates that um, about a third of patients treated for um, anorexia and bulimia um, relapse within the first few years of completing treatment. Um, and, and so if you are supporting someone, I really, really want to stress um, to prioritize your own self-care and community care to prevent burnout. Okay. Health at every size um, has had a bunch of mixed, um, so it can be a little bit mixed reviews, um, but at the Looking Glass, we practice and support from a health at every size lens. Um, this is um, one of the main messages is that people deserve an environment and culture that supports their health, regardless of their size. Um, the principles of health at every size 
um, is that um, size inclusivity, health enhancement, respectful care, eating for well-being, and life enhancing movement. Um, Hayes um, wants to really highlight that our health, our, our weight and size is not necessarily, a, it's not a causation for poor health, but um, that our lifestyle is, is connected to our health outcomes, partly. Okay, Lindo Bacon, um, one of the main thinkers of Health at Every Size says, um, there are many ways to measure health, weight is just a marker of size. Health is influenced by the environment, one's genetics, economic, and social and psychological factors. These include nutrition and movement, access to green spaces, toxins and pollutants that we are um, absorbing, quality and length of sleep, stress, mental health, quality of our relationships, that's a big one, um, education and income levels, discrimination that we experience, and access to healthcare. Okay, um, this is really, really important um, because many of the people in our community who live in larger bodies um, might uh, experience quite harmful experiences in healthcare, and that might prevent them from reaching out for support, um, or they might dismiss and, and minimize that they have an eating disorder, or that our society will promote them to have an eating disorder to then meet um, a, a lower weight for uh, the, the, the health um, that's been told to them they need to achieve. And that's incredibly harmful because then we're conditioning people to develop eating disorders, okay? What not to do with someone who has an eating disorder? We do not want to label them as their eating disorder, right? For example, that person is a bulimic. Um, this is not not fair um, to make someone that their whole identity, um, where somebody doesn't have to live with an eating disorder their whole life. Um, it is a, a, a struggle and and something that they're that they can move through and work through, and it does not depict. Uh, their their identity. Okay, we do not want to moralize food by talking about right or wrong ways to eat. Um, we don't want to focus on someone's weight or BMI as a marker for health. Um, we want to uh, not talk about or comment on your own body or their body or other people's bodies and their appearance uh, doing comparison across bodies. Um, so we don't want to be saying, you know, you aren't fat, uh, your body looks perfect, my body's bigger than yours, so you have nothing to worry about. This is what's called fat talk. Um, and this is perpetuating that harmful, oppressive framework that fatness is bad and thinness is good. We, we do not want to be um, aligning with that to help someone who has an eating disorder and just all humans to be uh, caring and loving. We do not wanna praise thinness and celebrate discipline with eating. And um, we don't want to not believe somebody if they come forward and sharing that they have an eating disorder or disordered eating. Okay. And there's probably a lot more, but that's just a few. What we do wanna do, uh, we want to self-reflect on the ways that we engage and are influenced by diet culture, your experience with misogyny or internalized misogyny, and look at ways you can allow, um, look at ways that you allow or don't allow yourself to take up space, okay? We want to validate the person um, and the, the, the pressures and expectations that they face to change their body for survival or social approval. Um, in a very toxic um, social and cultural landscape we live in. We want to help them unpack diet culture and systems of oppression that they are affected by. We want to work towards unlearning weight stigma and discrimination and stereotypes of fatness, educate others on health at every size, be curious and help to decrease isolation, help others connect and see their strengths and acknowledge all of who they are outside of the eating disorder. This one is super duper important. Um, a lot of times when people are really struggling, 
healthcare providers, family members can really hyper focus on the eating disorder. And I understand why, because they 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 don't want it to be present for for their loved one. Um, but in the mix, the person on who has the eating disorder can learn, oh, this is the way that I get my needs met. This is the way that I receive care. Everyone's focused on the eating disorder. And whether they're conscious to it or not, part of them might actually hold on to the eating disorder because there's so much focus. And what would it be like if nobody focused on them? What would it be like if no one showed concern about the eating disorder? Um, there can be a fear with that. We want to encourage and advocate for people to see a medical, a medical team, medical care for their eating disorder to get connected with a GP or family doctor. Um, I know that in BC, um, our, um, our family doctors are, are um, hard to come by and lots of people don't have a family doctor. Um, there's, you know, if we can try to advocate for people to get connected, that's going to be really important. Um, one is because with eating disorders, things can go, for lack of a better word, sideways pretty quickly. Um, they're um, sort of, uh, um, how do I say it? The electrolytes, right? If they have electrolytes imbalances, um, their organs can actually start to shut down. Um, and we don't know when the next purge or when the next time um, that those electrolytes could be all um, out of whack and then someone could be in serious trouble. Um, so we, we want to make sure that they're getting that care. And also um, the way that BC is set up, we have primary, secondary and tertiary care. Um, and in primary care, that is the, the family doctors or the doctors um, that are seeing on the front line, the, the clients that come and patients that come forward. Um, and so then they need to um, you know, know this so that they can help them get connected to the primary or tertiary care um, that we have in our public system. So really important, please make sure you're advocating for that. Okay. Some Common treatment approaches. I have a list here, um, and there's there's more. Um, but what is important to note is that as much as we want to follow evidence based practices, the evidence base has also left a lot of people out. Um, men, gender diverse folks, BIPOC people, people with low socioeconomic status. Um, so evidence is important. But so is listening to the people who are sharing lived experiences about feeling excluded from eating disorder treatment and a call for decolonization of conventional ED approaches is needed. Um, so just um, wanted to share that. But whatever theory you are working from, if you are a counselor um, or if you are a supporter in the field of any kind, um, you can include these approaches. Um, so the haze informed approach, and an intuitive eating lens, um, early behavior intervention, so supporting people quite early on in, in making some behavioral changes, having a trauma-informed and harm reduction perspective. What I mean by harm reduction um, is not, um, like, of course, actual self-harm. Um, we want to be supporting people with, uh, with, uh, with that, but I mean, if somebody uh, is used to purging every single day, um, and then they decrease that um, to once a week, we, we want to see that as harm reduction and, and help them um, feel empowered to make more changes instead of having the approach of, oh, well, they're still purging, so the treatment isn't successful. We want to highlight the, the changes that they make. Um, and when we do that, all of the little steps add up to big, big change. It's more sustainable actually when we are when we are doing the smaller change. So highlighting that, celebrating that every step of the way. Okay, a postmodern feminist um, influence is, is um, great. Having a person-centered approach and developing cultural humility and self-compassion. Any work that you can do um, helping someone develop more self-compassion will be wonderful for their journey. Now, recovery is not linear. It goes up and down and sideways. And, and, um, and, and so we want to help people with that expectation management that um, although we want to keep going in this direction, we might have some, some days that are 
are off and um, we can take a pause to look at that, what's working, what's not working and help to instill hope that full recovery is possible. Okay. It is common for individuals to vacillate between wanting to get well and wanting um, to stay in their eating disorder. And try to remember that it's not your job to convince them. Instead, we want to show compassion for where they are and remind them that it's normal to have bad days and weeks and encourage them to do self-care. Some recovery prompts that, that you can use um, is to help people get a little more clear on um, their readiness for change, right? That's this, you know, place of their, their, their values are in alignment with recovery, um, there's motivation for it, they have, um, they have something to look forward to um, as they continue recovery. Um, we can ask them, what does a balanced or healed relationship to food and body look like? Is their eating disorder or disordered eating a problem for them? Why or why not? Why is it important to move towards recovery? What makes them feel ready to take a step in that direction now, right? If they've been on the fence for a long time and now they're ready, let's unpack that, right? What, what makes them feel ready um, to do it now? What changes do they need to make? What changes you know, do they think they need to make? I, I guess I should clarify. And what strengths can they tap into to help them mobilize that change? Right? I've worked with someone who um, identified as being really stubborn um, and that keeping the eating disorder was part of that stubbornness, right? So a reframe could be, um, and how could we use that stubbornness in a different way that could be more useful for you? Right? Instead of it being to hold the eating disorder, maybe the stubbornness could be directed towards, I'm stubborn in my resiliency to continue and, and make more steps. Right? What are the potential consequences if they stay the same? Um, I think this one is va valuable because people might not be thinking long term right? In five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, what their life is going to be like if they continue to stay where they are. This can be a powerful aha wake up moment for, for many. Um, identifying what the barriers are that they think will get in the way of change and how they can prepare or plan to, over, to overcome those barriers. Mm -hmm. Swapping a positive thought for a negative thought will not fully fix the issue with low self-esteem, harsh inner critics, rigid thinking, negative, negative thoughts about the body. But practicing new ways of thinking and relating to others and our bodies is helpful to change our neural pathways. Right? Neurons that fire together, wire together. And so we do want to support that cognitive piece but we also want to attempt to move into the body and access the wisdom that it has to share. So in this, we wanna create safety in the body and attuning to its subtle communications to fully live and experience the liberation, pleasure, connection, and joy that being um, you know, in its landscape can offer us. Um, for folks who have experienced trauma, um, this will take some time. And we do not want to push it and we don't want to rush them. We want to take our time and really build that body trust and that safety um, as you see uh, important um, with your patients and clients. Um, and practicing interoception. So that's that mind body connection, the ability to be present and aware of what I'm feeling in and sort of outside the body. This has been noted to decrease body image distress and dissatisfaction and has been um, seen to be really helpful for lots of different um, disorders and mental health issues. Okay. Body image. Um, we have kind of a, a spectrum here. Neg body negativity, body neutrality, body positivity. Um, and I believe that we are the body, but we are also more than the body. We're experiencing our whole life through this interface of this fleshy suit casing that we are in. Um, and we can't necessarily, I don't think it's fair to say, and, and um, Dr. Hillary McBride made this point, um, that maybe we shouldn't be striving for body neutrality, 
um, because the body is highly politicized that it, may, it can't be neutral, but we could strive towards appearance neutrality. Okay. Um, and if people cannot take on a, a positive body image, that might feel like too much, that they, they can't go there, that doesn't feel accessible. We don't want to make that the target. Um, body neutrality can be extremely um, liberating in itself. And then if people get there, wonderful, then maybe we can reevaluate and see if they want to go for more, if they would like to go for body positivity. But by no means is it um, something that we should be um, making a, a, a goal if that doesn't fit uh, the people that we're supporting. Body image is typically the last piece to fall into recovery, not the first. And this is people wish that it was the opposite. I often hear people say, well, if I just like my body, then maybe I will take some steps forward in recovery. Um, and we can't wait for that because we're going to wait a very, very long time or the change will be conditional. Right. Someone will go on a new diet or something where they change the body and then they feel better about it. And then they think that they're taking strides. And then if the body changes again, which it often does, we go, we go through fluctuations on a daily basis, a seasonal basis, yearly and across the lifespan. Our body, that is the one thing that is guaranteed. It's always going to be changing. Okay. Um, and so we cannot wait um, for the body image piece before we take steps. Um, and um, one way that we can think of this is that... Uh, the brain is kind of like um, Teflon for positivity with our negativity bias and Velcro for negativity. Um, so I think of this as sort of like the uh, colors. Um, if, if we're in a dark space, can we, can we try and move towards like a gray space or a dark gray charcoal space when it comes to the way that we're um, uh, caring for the body or viewing the body or thinking about the body and then moving towards um, maybe a light gray and so on and so forth. So um, helping people move from negative to neutral and then to positive. Um, I think it's really important to focus on respect. I have not met a person who doesn't want to be respected. Um, and so exercising that value with people is really helpful. Um, how do they want to respect their body? How do they want other people to respect them? What does that look like? Um, is there any sense of gratitude that they could develop for, for the body, um, for what it, it does? And I am mindful around this one, um, depending on someone's ability, uh, if they have an invisible disability or a physical disability, um, finding gratitude for the body might be challenging depending what it is. And so meeting people where they're at, I'm seeing if finding gratitude could be a useful, um, useful thing for them, right? Like holding a cup um, and, and uh, hydrating oneself or dancing or um, being able to read with our eyes or hear beautiful music, okay? We want to look inside of ourselves. So if the body is this casing to our, to our personality, to our soul, to our, to our inner life, um, what can we get to know on the inside and start develop that self-concept and identity uh, for more than, than the physical appearance? Um, aiming to try to find acceptance of where we're at um, and not trying to fix or change or judge um, where we're at in recovery or or the body right um, we can make a non-negotiable or encourage people to have a non-negotiable um, around repair um, and treating ourselves as worthy of care um, so um, again that respect piece how can we make that the baseline that even if you don't believe you're worthy of care how can we treat how can you treat yourself as if you're worthy of care and in any relationship, if there is a rupture, it's all about the repair, how we repair that relationship. We've seen that in couples work. Um, and we can apply that same strategy to the body, right? If, if I've done something that's hurt the body, either through my thoughts or my actions, how do I want to repair um, that fracture that I've created? And that's going to be where that self-compassion work comes in, okay? 
All right. So questions that we can explore with um, folks who are struggling with an eating disorder. Um, we can look at, you know, what is it like to be a body in the social context that we're living in? What messages did you receive about bodies growing up? What social or cultural messages shape your experience of yourself? What social power do you have? And how has that impacted your experience of your body? What role does your eating disorder play in your life? What, what are the ways you feel it helps you? And what are the ways you feel it hurts you? This is really important um, to help people understand the function that the eating disorder has played and is currently playing and to help them assess, do I really need that? Do I need to keep this? Maybe it served me back then when I was going through different life circumstances and I didn't have the tools and resources I needed, but now, you know, where am I at? Do I, do I still need it? Okay. Um, what are the ways you feel it hurts you? I think I mentioned that. Um, are you in, um, after you engage in behaviors, how do you feel? Helping people develop that interoception. What do you typically do to process those feelings? Um, understanding um, with, with somebody, you know, if this self-care thing works one day and it doesn't work the other day, why? Let's understand what's, what's changing, what's going on for them and helping them to get creative um, and to access agency for trying new things. Um, sometimes I hear from clients, they'll say, oh, well, it doesn't, that doesn't work, right? That meditation doesn't work or writing a journal um, to the eating disorder, that doesn't work. All these other things, they don't work. And if you hear that from the people in your, in your life uh, when you are supporting them in this way, um, you can ask, okay, how do you know it doesn't work? What are the measures? What are the markers that you are going off of it not working? And how much effort are you putting into that particular strategy to see if it does work, right? Are they doing it once, twice, three times? That's really not enough. Um, of course, if it's, a, if it's a hard no, then we can respect that. Um, but encouraging people to be consistent with a practice um, instead of trying something once and then, and then discarding it as not working, um, I would see that as part of a, the defense mechanism of an eating disorder. Um, that, um, you know, that's part of the part of them that doesn't want to change. Um, so encouraging people to try things out for a few weeks. Um, and then reevaluating um, from there. Okay. What do you think the cost is to your well being by continuing to engage with yourself that way? Right? That's helping people to confront the eating disorder and, and um, what the, the, the cost could be. What is your relationship to control? What is your relationship to freedom? I would also add, what is your relationship to chaos? Right. Unpacking those pieces and then seeing how they pertain back to the eating disorder or disordered eating. Um, where is freedom showing up? Where is control showing up? Is chaos showing up? Um, I believe that you know freedom and control are somewhat on opposite ends of the spectrum. And I try to help people fall in love more with freedom than they do control when they are um, struggling with more of the restrictive um, eating disorders. Um, and we can also ask a, a bit of a, a kind of a longer term question here, which is what wisdom might your 88 or 90 or 100 year old future self want you to know? Can they connect to an older, an older uh, future version of them? And what does that version of them want for them now? Can they access their own, their own wisdom um, to help them see things differently or see things more clearly? Okay. All right. Um, so I've written here a few resources. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a few because I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, but if you're interested, um, there's a couple podcasts I quite like. Um, the Lettuce Eat Cake 
podcast with Ali and Hannah. They are two local um, Vancouver um, registered dietitians doing some really great work um, for us. And then the Food Psych podcast with Christy Harrison um, has a lot of information as well, dispelling um, things around diet culture and talking a lot about disordered eating and eating disorders. Um, a couple Instagram accounts. Um, so the I think it's the Godini Clinic. Um, this is a, a clinic of, of, of doctors who specialize with eating disorders and share a lot of really helpful and important information um, for, um, for how to support. So any, if you have any doctors in the house, I would recommend um, you checking them out. And then Fierce Fatty is a wonderful um, person um, who I believe actually lives in Vancouver, um, helping um, people unlearn fat bias. Okay, so they are great. And then a few books. We have The Eight Keys to Recovery from an Eating Disorder by Carolyn Costin, um, The Wisdom of Your Body by Hilary McBride, The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love by Sonia Renee Taylor, phenomenal, um, Fat Talk, Parenting in the Age of Diet Culture by Virgin Soul Smith, and Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating by Christy Harrison. And then a harm reduction resource um, with Gloria Lucas is there. Okay. Um, and at the Looking Glass Foundation, um, just to give you a little snippet about what we, what we do. Um, so we have a few different programs. Um, in the foundation, we have uh, personal recovery space, which is an online program, an online forum where um, somebody struggling with disordered eating uh, will get connected with trained volunteers and be supported in this written written forum. And then the online peer support is a chat space um, where um, people come uh, at planned times and get support and support each other. So it's more peer um, peer related. And then we have the hand in hand program, which is the program that I run um, at the Looking Glass. It's face to face support with trained volunteers supporting um, folks who are struggling. That might be in person or or virtually, depending um, depending. Um, and then we have the Bridge the Gap program, um, which our other wonderful therapist Kayla Scott runs. Um, which is a low cost counseling program specific for um, eating disorders. Okay, we also have the Looking Glass Residence. Um, and then there's a couple um, pieces of, of information to contact us. Okay, um, so I know I threw a ton at you and it um, was fast and furious. And I hope that you were able to catch all that I was speaking to. Um, I know that I, I, I didn't get a chance to speak um, to uh, much of the, the public system um, or, um, or any you know, specific, going in depth with any specific um, therapies, but I would like to open it up um, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask, if we have a little bit of time. Thank you so much, Alex. I don't know if you see the thanks happening in the chat, plus some resources and, and different things. Um, I've got a handful of questions here I could bring forward if you like. Wonderful. We've got a, I hope we've got I can a, answer them, but I might not be able to. So. Yeah, and you know, I think when we put this forward, I think what we realized in the response is likely we're going to have to look at um, future sessions in different ways uh, to do with this topic, heading into talking about youth, different things, right? It, it's a large topic. So, um, uh, okay, so I'm going to give you a few questions here. Great. Uh, so I've got one here, how to best support siblings who are struggling with a sibling with an eating disorder? Do you have anything specific? Do both siblings have an eating disorder? I'm not sure, and you can feel free to um, raise your hand. I can unmute you. Hi there. Um, yeah, the the sibling does not have an eating disorder. It's a younger uh, sibling that I'm working with as a school counselor, and it is an older brother who is a teenager who has the disordered eating. So I'm just curious in terms of tips for helping me. I mean, I've learned so many today. Thank you. But 
to support the young the younger sibling who's struggling with what they're seeing mm, mm-hmm. oh okay thank you for that um if i'm hearing correctly um jocelyn that you're working with um the child who does not have an eating disorder but they are in a family with an older brother who does have an eating disorder that's correct okay okay First off, I, I I would want to give um, some space to to that client, which I'm sure you're already doing. Like, what what do they think and feel around this? How has the eating disorder, in their opinion, impacted their relationship with their sibling? Um, and um, I think yeah, giving really giving space for their process. Um, because what can happen in family systems is a lot of focus can go to the person who has the eating disorder, and then the other siblings feel like they're left in the dust. Um, and then they feel like that there's no space for them to have any issues, that they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to come forward with what they're struggling with if they're struggling with other stuff, because they feel like, oh gosh, you know, my parents are, they don't have any time or space, and I want to make it easier for them. So it's this family system um, almost compensation that that um, client can could potentially be doing and and encouraging that person that they're allowed to also take up space they're allowed to have feelings about this Um, they might not want uh, I wouldn't necessarily say um, for them to uh, have a have a big um, airing uh, with their sibling if the sibling is in a, in a critical or com- really compromised position. But at some point, maybe discussing with your client and the family if there was an opportunity um, of doing a little bit of family therapy as well could be a good uh, idea. Great, thanks so much. Uh, so the question is: Is there a connection between self harm and eating disorders? I know that's a large question. So mm, yeah. I would say that um, we see in the community a lot of self-harm um, with eating disorders. So um, I would argue that, that eating disorders can be a form of self-harm, um, especially if it's coming from like a punishing attitude or mentality um, that someone might feel like they're not deserving to eat food or they're going to punish themselves by eating a lot of food. That is self-harm. But in terms of the other form that I think this person's referring to around, you know, cutting, hitting, bruising, burning, that kind of thing, we do see a, quite a bit of that. Um, and I would explore, of course, making sure that person's safe, doing, you know, a suicide assessment, um, risk assessment, but um, understanding maybe how those two Um, interact with one another the eating disorder and the self-harm when one when one increases what happens to the other one does it also increase or does that one get get less Um, I would say yeah understanding that a little bit more and then um, helping them with a harm reduction uh, lens um, how to find ways to take care of themselves um, in both arenas great I have a question here. How do you take into account individuals with ADHD and ASD in the way that you treat disorders? Mm -hmm. Oh, such a good question. I just watched a webinar today on this from the Renfrew Center, um, and it was really fascinating um, to see that. And I don't have the research handy on me, but I can find it for you if you'd like, um, that there's quite a high... um, Uh, comorbidity with um, ADHD and autism with eating disorders um, and uh, autism with um, ARFID. um, So that's the avoidant um, uh, restrictive food intake disorder. Um, And I think it's important that we we need to look at the symptomology of of those um, neurodiverse folks of what they're experiencing with their neurodivergence um, and factoring that in to our treatment that, um, you know, for example, if somebody um, is um, has ADHD and they uh, have high impulsivity, that might be contributing to the urge to binge. Um, so looking at looking at that and how they interact with one another, um, are they on a medication, um, on a stimulant? Because sometimes if people are struggling with anorexia, um, it might not, it could be, but it might not be the best route um, because that could actually contribute to uh, eating less 
uh, because the stimulant um, uh, decreases appetite. So we want to we want to be aware of of all these different things of how their symptomology um, from other um, other stuff um, could be impacting the eating disorder and which ones which right? which pieces are coming from where. So we might ask you for that resource and then we'll put it alongside the recording as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple of more questions and then we'll hop off the line and it's a hot night here. So um, I've got uh, how to support a pregnant client noticing eating disorder inklings returning. The client's in recovery has been for years, but pregnancy is drawing more attention to the changing body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, I think my question, my answer um, is not uh, satisfactory to cover like the complexity of, of that experience. Um, but um, what I would uh, maybe focus on is, is one, the pressures that society places on folks who are pregnant and, and who bear children. Um, you know, there, there's things called like the, um, what's it called? Like the, uh, baby but like the, after the baby bump body or like this expectation to essentially lose all the weight that that one gained during pregnancy really fast um and and um and that's a lot of pressure and also yucky diet culture so unpacking that um unpacking um what it's like to share their body with with another human um right they're growing a human inside of them what is that experience like um i would maybe look at um, what, uh, what are they looking forward to that, or what, what gratitude can they find of their body for doing this, um, miraculous thing of growing a human inside of it? Can we shift the narrative a little bit to look at, um, the ways in which the body is really serving them, um, but also balancing that out with looking and validating the fears and the, and the body image and, um, and you know, you could also talk about, and I'll say one last thing here, talking about um, what what messages do they want to uh, provide for their child um, around body agency um, and uh, body autonomy? Um, how would they want their child to feel as they grow up in their body? Um, what do they want to model for their child? And unpacking that and looking at their values um, of uh, the, the values that they have for parenting and you could maybe try and find a bit of of motivation to um, shift their perceptions um, that are tied to diet culture thank you so much alex i i'm gonna leave it there because uh, i i want to be mindful of letting everyone go um we truly appreciate you bringing your expertise and your time to the whole group and i want to thank everybody for taking the evening to join us and i hope you've gotten a lot out of it i see some lovely thanks in there i hope you see it as well um i i would like to say that we do have another matters of the mind coming up in about three weeks and it is on self-compassion as well so it's actually ties in to a lot of what you're talking about so different practices and and stuff like that but I want to thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone. Bye.